Li Shangjing, Cold Thoughts. You left. Waves lap at my doorstep. Cicadas now sit mute on dew filled branches. This is the time of year for memories. I lean in contemplation for a while. Springs distant as the dipper in the north. No messenger has reached me from the south. Here, at the world's end, I search for signs in dreams. To ease suspicions that you found another friend. So we continue with Li Shangjing's poems. This is the fourth out of the five that are included in this anthology in the pentasyllabic uh, new style regulated form. Like uh, the other poems that we've been encountering, this one has a pretty conventional topic, cold thoughts. Uh, so cold here, the cold in the title, I imagine, is meant to refer to the coldness of the season in which the poem is set, which seems to be pretty clearly autumn. There's no, you know, there's one image that seems to be very clearly pointing to autumn, the others are indirect. But also they are cold thoughts in the sense that they are sad thoughts. Cold as in the heart feeling cold and the heart feeling sad. The topic of the poem is, of course, separation. Not exactly parting, because uh, in the context of this poem, both the poetic persona and the unnamed friend who is referred to in the poem have already been separated for an unspecified amount of time. But remember, separation is a very common theme of, of Chinese poetry, along with parting. Parting is the beginning of separation. Uh, you could say it's part of a subgenre of poems on separation, which deals with uh, you know, the, 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 the beginning of the separation, just as poems on re-encountering a friend after a long time are also or could be considered part of the genre. So separation poems are always sad. They always lament uh, the separation of one person from another. Sometimes they take the form of a male and a female persona in a dialogue, for example, lovers or husband and wife. But a lot of the time, I think, and I think that would be the case here, although uh, classical Chinese is notoriously unspecific uh, most of the time about gender and number and gender, uh, I, I think we're supposed to understand in this poem that, that the poetic persona of Li Shangjing is talking, is thinking about a friend who is far away. So we've already seen also how the Chinese like to pile up the background elements, <coughs> the macrocosmic elements, with the microcosm of the poet's feelings. So here the feelings are sadness at separation, which generally includes overtones of uh, sadness at the passage of time and aging. And one of the ways of, of, of emphasizing this background, uh, this, back, this feeling, sorry, is with the background uh, for example, that includes autumn as the season, which is the, the, the southern time of the day, uh, sorry, the southern time of the year, uh, maybe sunset or night, which is the saddest part of the day, and uh, other elements, for example, um, images from nature that, that, that also connote sadness or coldness. Uh, not too much of an imagery here, mm, not too many natural images here. Uh, but let's uh, let's take a look at the poem as usual, couplet by couplet. Okay, first couplet. You left. Waves lap at my doorstep. Cicadas now sit mute on dew-filled branches. So the first couplet, as usual, puts us in the locus. It starts very clearly. You left. You are no longer here. And uh, we get the description of the consequences of the aftermath of the friend leaving. And it says, waves lap at my doorstep. Cicadas now sit mute on dew-filled branches. Well, one thing that, that, mm, that, 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 that I immediately notice is the emphasis on images of movement, which makes sense because we're talking about uh, the friend leaving. So just as the friend left, the waves are lapping at the doorstep of the poet's home. 
Now, these waves lapping don't seem to be clearly pointing to any seasonal um, event or time, but they actually do. These would probably be river waves, not sea waves. And uh, I think we've already encountered a poem or two a few days ago. I think one that talked about the waters of Lake Dongting rising by Shu Hung. I imagine, uh, I, I would need to confirm this, but probably in autumn, uh, the Chinese rivers uh, rise um, in, 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 in the water. So, so the waves are probably higher in autumn. And I imagine this would be the first indication of the season, this, this, these waves rising, which at the same time mimic the friend parting, the friend traveling. Uh, in the second line, we get uh, the clearest seasonal indication in the whole poem. Cicadas now sit mute on dew-filled branches. As opposed to the movement of the friend, the cicadas remain still uh, and mute. They don't make any noise. Uh, in dew-filled branches, so... Cicadas, dew, that always points us towards autumn. Yeah? In autumn the dew falls, the cicadas, which were so noisy in the summer, become silent, they die away or they hide in their burrows, and uh, it's the time for dew, and very soon it will be the time for frost. So we're getting into the cold season and the cold part of the year, with uh, yang declining and ying increasing. This is the time of year for memories. I lean in contemplation for a while. So the second couplet, mm, after these images, mm, puts us on a more conceptual level. Uh, the mm, time of the year hasn't been stated explicitly, but enough has been said indirectly. And uh, this is emphasized now by saying this is the time for memories. Mm, I imagine autumn can be a time for melancholy and memories. As it is associated with the beginning of the decline of manhood, it's a time for reminiscing the past, for, for contemplating one's life up to now, the successes and the failures. And in this meditative, melancholy state of mind is in which Li Shangjing seems to be feeling after the departure of his friend. Third couplet. Spring is distant as the dipper in the north. No messenger has reached me from the south. Now, the third couplet doesn't quite emphasize images of movement, but images of distance, which would have been a consequence of the previous movements. Being a parallelistic couplet, you can see some of the parallelism at play in the translation. So, uh, spring is distant, the season. So, in autumn, it's quite distant. It's uh, still two seasons away, at least. And as distant as the dipper in the north, the dipper would be what we call Ursa Maioris, uh, the, the, the bear constellation in the northern hemisphere, it, which in Chinese is viewed uh, not as a bear, but as a dipper, a water dipper. And, of course, spring is distant as the constellation in the sky is distant. We're very far from spring. Remember, spring generally evokes universal renewal, the meeting of lovers, and in this case could act as a symbol for the hypothesized desired meeting of the friends. Also interesting, Dipper is an image of water which connects which, with the waves in, in the doorstep. Water is generally a symbol of jin, it's generally a symbol of winter, you know, of those images of coldness and separation of the cold thoughts that are evoked in the poem. And no messenger has reached me from the south. Uh, we don't know how much distance there is from where Li Shangjing is speaking in the south. I don't know where he wrote this poem. But where, wherever it was, probably a, a relatively middle position, or maybe northern position in China, big distance from the south. And we are led to imagine that the friend to whom this poem is dedicated, or rather about whom this poem is about, is probably in the south of China, in the area of the Jiangsu or below. So distances are emphasized. The distance in time to spring. The distance in elevation to the polar stars and the distance from here to the south, or the, the land distance, to where the friend might be dwelling. And no messengers come. Why don't they come? Is it because the distance is tough? Or is there another possibility? That other possibility creeps into these uh, sad thoughts, into these contemplations of Li Shangjing, and is clearly mm, vocalized in the last couplet. Here, at the world's end, I search for signs in dreams to ease suspicions that you found another friend. 
So, interesting, in the last couplet, the poet seems to place himself at the world's end, which uh, might seem to indicate that he's in some peripheral region, probably not in the south, because his friend is in the south. He might be maybe at the border region of the empire in the north. I don't know. I, I don't have enough background information. And uh, anyway, he is far from his friend. He is uh, upset at not receiving news from him, and he's exploring dreams. Remember, in a lot of poems... Dreaming, traveling in dreams is the way to reach the loved one or a friend who is far away. And he, search, he searches in dreams uh, to make sure that the lack of communication is not because his friend in the remote south has forgotten him or substituted him for another friend. So if this poem was actually sent to the friend, it would feel like a little bit of a mild complaint, like, hey, have you forgotten me? I'm receiving no news. I've received no news from, from you for a long, long time. And, okay, that's it. J just would like to say, I've checked a couple of other translations of the poem. They're wildly, wildly different. Well, that shouldn't be so surprising. We've talked uh, before in the past that Chinese lines tend to be, in classical poetry, very condensed. We get no indication of the subject. Uh, we get verbs that, depending on the context, could be acting as adjectives. We get no indication of tense, and, you know, sometimes it's not clear who is, who and how many are the subjects of the action, who and how many are the recipients of the action in each line. So, you know, there, there, there's, and I, I think I've read also somewhere that Li Shangjing is, you know, even more of a culprit in, in, this, in, in this area. You know, this ambiguity, this open-endedness was cultivated by the Chinese scholar officials, as a virtue in itself, you know, being very synthetic and very evocative. Very few characters with very many possible readings. So in this matching up, uh, in a way, the, the literary criticism of the, of the new criticism, the critics of the English 20th century that valued ambiguity so much in classical poetry. But uh, anyway, be it as it may, it feels, this feels, let us conclude, as a pretty conventional poem on the separation of friends and on the sadness that is a concomitant consequence of such a separation.